Welcome to the Archetypal Mosaic. The guest today is educator, author, editor, and daughter of Alan Watts, Anne Watts. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, you have a very profound and interesting history, your work, your books. Um, we're going to discuss your, you know, your father and your background. Please tell us first of... Um, about Ann Watts, about you. How did you come about and what is your background from your earliest childhood memories and imaginations? Well, that's a huge, <laughs> huge range to, to cover. Um, you know, uh, I would say that um, I had a very um, different kind of upbringing in so many ways, just given who my father was and the company that he kept and the people who were in our home and, and in our sphere, um, I, you know, I just had a very different kind of experience. Um, you know, it's not so different for many people that we traveled a lot and I lived in various different places um, and I came from a broken home um, and uh, at some point, my grandparents saw how challenging my life was, my father's parents, and they arranged for me to go and live with them in England and go to the girls' boarding school that was right next to their property. And, uh, and so that was a pivotal time for me that I felt really uh, saved my life, really, because I felt like I was going crazy as, as I was. And um, and so I was there for five years um, in girls boarding school, what the years that in America we would call high school years. And, um, and so that was very uh, meaningful time for me. And um, yeah. Um, Did you find... When I did you find yep. grounding in that boarding school? Was there the kind of grounding that you didn't feel at home? Well, definitely between being in boarding school and the loving care of my grandparents, mm -hmm. uh, I definitely, I felt, um, you know, the school was uh, like a haven for me. And um, it was very different because when I went to the UK, what we now call the UK, um, I, uh, I was um, very mature, very adult. And I had to relearn how to be a, a kid. And, uh, and so that was, that was an, a, an interesting experience also, just to let go of being as grown up as I was in, in order to, to fit in. And because uh, <laughs> the people that I related to were the seniors in the school. Mm -hmm. And rather than the, the kids who were my own age, and um, and that was very frowned on socially. So I really had to to learn how to be a kid again. So in and, a way, the uh, the intelligence and the emotional intelligence seems to have co gone come to you through DNA. It's in the family <laughs> blood. <laughs> I think you're probably right about that. I think that goes throughout my entire family. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me, uh, now your father would be considered a great philosopher of our time, would you say? Um, that's what I um, perceive. And um, I, I'll, I'll tell you that in working on this book that my sister and I put together, um, reading his letters, I was amazed at his brilliance and amazed at the, um, the maturity that he had at a very young age. And, and it was a different kind of maturity. You know, like I think I have a, an emotional, I had an emotional maturity very young, whereas he, um, he had a very, uh, like the brilliant mind from very young. And um, when I, I was reading letters, and I would have to stop and calculate how old was he when he wrote this? <laughs> you know, like in his early 20s, he was writing things that were just astounding. Um, and so, uh, you know, 
you know, that it, that was something that I got to witness in a very different way than, than I had witnessed growing up. It, it was really, um, I, I guess, re- revelatory uh, for me in that way. Yeah. Now, uh, I have so many questions that have come up, including where where were all the letters? Where were they? Um, well, my uh, father's uh, third wife, uh, Jano, had uh, had all those letters, and she had um, put them in boxes in storage. And um, and then uh, when she died, uh, the letters came to my sister and myself. And my sister, um, because I was away at the time, she took care of them and she housed them in her home in a file cabinet. And uh, we were visiting um, our editor um, at New World Library, uh, talking about other books that uh, they were publishing and wanting to publish and that kind of thing. And Joan mentioned that, um, that's my sister, uh, she mentioned that she had this collection of letters and our publisher's eyes just lit up, and he said, those should be published. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so Joan and I took on that challenge to, uh, to do that work ourselves. And uh, so it was a, a two and a half year uh, labor of love doing all that, but it was, it was an amazing adventure for us. Now, were there letters that you had to figure out, maybe some of the writing and kind of fill it in? And also, were there letters that you decided that shouldn't go in the book? Oh, yeah. Um, To to the latter, definitely, yes. There were letters that that, uh, didn't feel like uh, they would add anything. I mean, there were so many books we had to, so many books, so many letters that we had to um, to edit at, at some point. And uh, and it wasn't easy, and <laughs> you know our our editors were wanting us to cut more, but were right with us that there were certain letters that just we felt we just couldn't we couldn't cut, and and um, and so that was an interesting dance for for all of us to uh, to figure that out. Um, you know, and somebody asked me if I would, if if I thought we would then do another uh, book with the other letters, and I really don't think so. I think we got the best, and um, and put the best in um, to the book. So, was there any single letter that's your favorite, either in the book or not in the book? Um, well, my. Some of my favorite letters are the letters he wrote when he was really young, when he was still in his early teens and away at boarding school. Um, they're just charming. The letters he wrote, uh, 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 the bulk of the letters, the b- biggest amount of letters are written to his parents. And he had a very loving relationship with them. And so it's, it's just very sweet to read those letters. And uh, he also did some drawings and illustrations that were um, wonderful. And I love seeing those in the book. Um, And then in his later years, um, there are, well, first of all, in in between all that, there are letters in which he describes when he arrives in America and how it looks to him and the, the beauty of the countryside. And then he describes in another letter later on his travels to California and um, the way he writes, he writes almost like a painter, and um, so that you could just see it as you read it. And that's another thing that I loved in his letters. And then finally, the um, the political letters that he wrote um, in support of Native Americans and um, keeping uh, the the law and the police force out of the bedroom and out of marijuana and LSD type drugs, you know, that kind of thing. And he wrote a lot of letters um, about all that, you know, and then his society, the society that he formed uh, brought a, a Tibetan, um, the Dalai Lama's Tibetan uh, interpreter to the U.S. and his family. And he had to write letters to, to make that happen. And so 
you know, he there were a lot of causes that he um, championed in a way that um, I really relate to, and so all that felt wonderful to me. And you know, the amazing thing is that all of that stuff is so totally relevant today, mm -hmm. and uh, so um, I feel like his writing in general is relevant today. And uh, so many people are discovering him even now, um, and that's pretty amazing. Yes, I have a, I have a friend who uh, Alan Watts is their very favorite uh, kind of guru. So they listen to him every night before they go to sleep. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you, the, now we're talking with Ann Watts about um, her life and the recently published book, The Collected Letters of Alan Watts by Ann and her sister Joan, published by um, New World Library and available at bookstores and Amazon and any other uh, retailer where books can be purchased. Um, and what's interesting is that both you and your father were at boarding school and then both of you were kind of set free to be intellectuals and writers and um do you think that there's something to the fact that um when you're at boarding school there's all these kind of tight uh behavioral and limitations and stuff and then your mind becomes kind of um starts circumventing and finds its own way out I just don't compare myself with my dad at all. Mm -hmm. I don't feel I'm at all in his league in that in that sense. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I don't know how much that's the case. Um, I think that uh, you know when I was in school and as I came out of school, I always had the thought that uh, I would marry an ugly man, because who else would have me, and uh, be a mom and raise children, mm -hmm. because that's just what I thought I, I was capable of. And uh, as it turned out, uh, I married, uh, I've been married twice, and both of my husbands have been very attractive, <laughs> and uh, much to my amazement. And uh, and I did have two children, um, and uh, and I and so that was kind of like my trajectory for a long time. And it wasn't until I was uh, it, much older I went to you know my kids were in high school and I went back to school and I did studied uh, at New College of California and. Um, and I studied with Virginia Satir, who was an amazing um, uh, teacher who had brought um, um, conjoint family therapy. She brought the model of, uh, you know, n that there's not an identified uh, patient, it's a family system. And, uh, and so she taught that. And... Um, and so that was very powerful and deep work. And I had a lot of uh, my own healing work to do from my own childhood. So um, I did that, and from, from that experience, I uh, developed a workshop, um, which has morphed into now uh, a workshop called Reclaiming Your Authentic Self, um, which I do every year at Esalen. And uh, and it's you know it's a conglomeration of the the tools that I learned and used that really made a difference for me and uh, helped me to to be more a more potent human being. Mm -hmm. And and then the other thing that I did was I went to um, a workshop. A man that I was dating at the time had uh, kept telling me about these workshops uh, led by Stan Dale. And I thought, well, if these are so important to you, I should go and uh, see what it's all about. And so I did my first workshop in 1983 with uh, Standale and um, in what has become the Human Awareness Institute in San. And uh, wow, 
talk about let, the transformative. Let me ask idea. you. Let me ask you a quick follow up about yeah. the. Um, uh, regaining your authentic self workshop, which is fantastic. Um, being uh, so, when there's kind of a star in a family, like your father was a star, and he was definitely his essential self, his true self, and it was shining so brightly. Did you feel like the fact that there's somebody near who is so full of the uh, like the essential self, they can overshine and shadow over? people around them and then the people near them start to lose themselves and don't know who they are? That's an interesting cause and effect question. Um, I suppose to some degree, um, I mean, you know, for instance, my experience with my dad was that uh, he could out-talk me on any subject. Mm. And so uh, oftentimes I would uh, stop. And I know he didn't mean to do that, but he did it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, like his own beliefs about something would be so strong. And, and so then I would just go quiet. And I think that was something that I carried with me uh, into adulthood, that, that business of, of going quiet and kind of disappearing and not, not putting myself forward. Uh, so in that sense, I would say um, that, 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 could be, that could be so. And, um, and yeah. back to your childhood. Um, so you were at boarding school. You went to California to spend time to live with your father. Was it like a hippie atmosphere? Were there a lot of interesting people in your house? Um, did that inspire you or um, make you feel uncomfortable? Um, yeah, my father's household wasn't, uh, at the time I was living with him, it was not like a hippie mm -hmm. kind of place. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, there were always very interesting people in his life. And, um, you know, I, I met a lot of interesting people through him, and, uh, and I appreciated that. And I certainly felt, I actually felt uh, comfortable. I, I didn't feel uncomfortable. Oh, great. Um, yeah. And um, now your work, the uh, inner child and the authentic self, you do those, you say, you do them once or several times a year. And uh, uh, Essen, is there other places where people can sign up and, and uh, get this um, knowledge from you? I do these workshops once a year at Esalen. It's a five-day workshop. Esalen Institute, E-S-A-L-E-N. Institute in Big Sur, California. And um, again, this is a place where my father used to teach. And um, I never imagined myself uh, being a teacher there. And now here I am. It's pretty interesting. Um, and this workshop, I limit to uh, 10 participants um, because we go so deep in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And my participants tell me again and again how much they appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. So that way everyone gets, you know, fully involved and there gets their time and, and attention. And uh, I think I said that we do several different modalities of, of healing work so that, you know, not one thing works for all people. And so people get an opportunity to... to uh, see what works for them, and uh, and they're all tools that they can take home and keep working with. So now, uh, are you planning to write any books about these two topics? And also, when you have these annual workshops and people go through their deep work and you go through it again, do you always learn um, new ways of healing yourself? You know, frequently I do. Absolutely, and I do private work with private clients, and uh, you know, and sometimes they're working on exactly what I'm working on. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know, it just feels like, yeah, right. I'm, 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 I'm getting this right along with you. Um, and so absolutely that's a, that's, that's a thing. I just have to be very clear that I keep my stuff separate from their stuff. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, what was the other piece of that? The other question is, uh, have you considered writing about these two topics? Oh, How interesting that I forgot that part. <laughs> <laughs> I have an enormous resistance to writing. Mm. And, um, and I know, again, this is part of my childhood stuff. Um, you know, with, with a father who was a famous, well-known writer, um, and I, I developed this story that it's all been said, and it's all been said better than I could say it. And, uh, and then, and so I notice every time I try to write, it's like pulling, uh, pulling nails. You know, it's just like it's really torturous for me. And, and so it's, you know, some people have a natural, natural proclivity um, for for writing, it's like it, they just can't stop themselves, which was my dad. He could not stop himself, and it's so funny, and se- several of his letters, he's apologizing for uh, writing so much, <laughs> because, you know, he just had so much to say. And um, I tend to be quieter, and I'm more of somebody who responds to a stimulus, mm-hmm. rather than one who creates Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Oh yes, it makes great sense. It actually leads perfectly to my next question about charisma, charisma, magnetism, and the unconscious. I want to bring those topics up and and ask you both about you and your father. Um, now, when your father was in a room, or when he was in his house, or wherever he he happened to be, the charisma. What was it like? How would you describe it? What kind of magnetism did he have as a person what kind of charisma do you feel you have and also the connection to the unconscious do you think all of those writings came from another place was it uh, similar to the unconscious or did it come from thinking um well a lot of his work i think came from thinking Mm -hmm. Um, however, he was a deeply intuitive person, um, and often knew things that, uh, other people might not know or expect. For instance, one of our mutual friends, um, saw him at some point for some counseling support, and she said during their session, there was this moment when he reached out and he put his hand on her knee and he said, I want you to just be prepared and don't be afraid. We're about to have an earthquake. Hmm. And sure enough, that was followed by an earthquake. And that was a story I've heard other stories of a similar nature from people uh, about their experience with my father. So, you know, from my perspective, there was definitely something else going on there. So I couldn't tell you how much of his work uh, is channeled or, um, or otherwise. About myself, I have this sense, you know, I have this sense, sometimes I have this little story that I make up that my higher self and my client's higher self have a conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that somehow something comes out of my mouth that I don't know where it comes from, mm-hmm. but it was it's just what my client needs, mm-hmm. right, to move forward or to do some shift in themselves. And and so you know I don't I when I'm doing my inner child work I say to people that all of us have a part of us which I call our inner wise one. Mm-hmm that's connect, connected to the wisdom of the universe. Mm-hmm. And that we can tune into that. And, uh, and so I will take, I will have their wise one and their child interact. That's like the first step. Mm-hmm. And because the 
wise one, I say, knows you better than any other human being on the planet. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's where they begin creating the kind of relationship that has them feeling safe, heard, important, uh, cared for, all of that. That's, that's a pretty easy uh, thing for people to do. It's so, all, in a is way, that answering your question? Oh, yeah. And in a way, it, it goes right directly back to your book. Because in a way, the child self and the wise self are writing letters to each other. And yeah. now tell me um, about charisma and magnetism. How would you describe that? Well, let's see. I would say my father was very charismatic. And, um, you know, some of it was just in, in his voice and how he sounded. And uh, people are very drawn to that voice. Um, and, uh, and so that's... Um, and then just his his way of being um, in a gathering in a in a group of people, um, he was like the word that comes to me scintillating. Um, people people were really uh, drawn to him, and he was drawn to them. Alan was very interested in in other people and uh, what made them tick, and he was very good at drawing people out. Um, so, you know, it, that, that was a special quality that he had. Um, so it was never all about him, uh, although he was good at taking center stage and he loved center stage. There's no doubt about it, which is why he called himself an entertainer. You know? Was there... Uh, and that's the other thing. He never wanted to be uh, a, a, called a guru or, you know... Um, like this person who knew all the answers or, you know, he saw himself as the fallible human being that he was. And, um, and he would try to get people to, to hear that and get that. And, you know, my, my feeling is you put somebody on a pedestal and there's only one way they can go and that's down, you know? And, um, and so, uh, often when people have found out about Alan's, frailties as a human being, um, his alcoholism and his uh, addiction to women, um, then they want to say, oh, well, he's just trash because he didn't live what he preached kind of thing. And and I have to say that in many ways he absolutely did, but he never preached about how anybody ought to live their life. You know, you, you brought up a very important subject, which is addiction and um, and not not specifically with him, but addiction and also um, kind of the sexual desire. You know what I personally believe, which is something really misunderstood in the society, um, is the fact that very creative people, including myself, um, sexuality can very much fuel the creativity. It takes you into a transcendent place. It's like fuel from which you can um, connect and create even stronger. Um, has your father ever discussed that or explained as to what was the need for that? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think he understood it himself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think often he wished it were not so. He wished it could be different, but it wasn't different, and he didn't know how to make it different. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he did say that. Um, and so I, I think there's some truth in what you're saying, because um, I, I, I witnessed that it's it's frequently a, a trait for people um, in high positions. Uh, who are, you know, sexuality is a very strong component of who they are and who they be, and um, and often it's difficult for them to manage it in a way that feels, um, I guess for me the thing that I always want people to do is to be respectful to the people that they're in relationship with. I agree with you completely. You know, and uh, and that was one of my sadnesses with my father that I, I feel like 
you know, it, it was he was doing what he was doing, and um, and he just uh, it wasn't a conversation. It wasn't there was nothing consensual or agreed upon about it, and and I think it, that was one of his sadnesses is that there was hurt I in see. the wake of of um, of his addictions. I see. And. Uh, Yes, consen- consensual is always key, absolutely. Let me ask you this question. Now, he had a total of uh, seven kids? He did. And um, now, somebody of that magnitude and charisma, they can treat uh, the daughters and the sons differently from each other. Did you notice that? What was the main difference? You know... When I was with him, uh, it was uh, my sister and myself. And uh, by the time the other family came along, that was just before the time that I moved to the UK. And so I'm, I don't really know mm-hmm. how differently he treated the, the boys from the girl. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to speak for my siblings. Mm-hmm. Um, Makes you know, sense. I, I know that they had some different experiences mm-hmm. from the experiences that Joan and I had because mm-hmm. their circumstances were different. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, uh, you know, I just don't feel equipped sure. to speak for them. I understand. Um, um, let me ask you a question yeah. about talismans. Um, did uh, your father... Uh, have a favorite talisman that provided him wisdom and strength and power? And did he ever give you one uh, that you may feel comfortable sharing or you don't have to, that you keep close and provides you with strength and archetypal power? No. Um, I don't... uh, He never gave me any such thing and that he never spoke of such a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't... uh, honestly don't think that that would have been a uh, something that he gave a lot of credence to okay. you know I uh, let me ask you about Zen Buddhism um, Zen uh, first of all how would you define Zen you know um I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. I am not a student of Zen, okay. and uh, I haven't been, mm-hmm. and so I I don't uh, I don't pretend to or attempt to uh, say I that I have any uh, authority or ideas in that area. Okay. I don't feel like I do. There is another book that uh, has just come out called Zen Odyssey. Yes. Um, and this is about your grandmother. Yeah. And how she, uh, in a way, brought Zen Buddhism to the United States. Yes? Now, that's very interesting, too, and that's currently the number one new release in the history of Buddhism on Amazon. Um, can you... Um, so there's two books out, audience. Um, again, one book, which Anne co-edited, is called The Collected Letters of Alan Watts. And the other book that came out just about a month after is called Zen Odyssey, the story of um, Sokian. Sokian. Sokian, Ruth Fuller, Sasaki, and the birth of Zen in America. Can you um, briefly tell us about this book? This book um, was researched for a long time by Janica Anderson, uh, the principal uh, author. She was her co-author was uh, Stephen Schwartz, and um, she uh, contacted everyone still living who knew my grandmother, and did extensive research. Um, so the book is very factual, but it's written in a, in a story fashion because she really wants this book made into a movie because uh, my grandmother was such an extraordinary woman. And, um, and so she follows her life and the life of Sokian, um, you know, how, how he first 
was sent by his uh, superior to the U.S. to bring Buddha Zen to the U.S. And um, all of how that went, and then her own um, trips to Japan to study herself. And, um, and so um, over the years, she um, eventually became the first woman and the first uh, foreigner accepted into the Zen priesthood in Japan. And she was given a temple at Daitokuji in Kyoto. And it's a fascinating story. And what's interesting, of course, is that the two stories overlap because her daughter was my mother. And it t- talks about when the, as she and uh, my mother went to London and went to the Buddhist Society in London where they met my father. And, and so there's a lot of interweaving. And Sokian was one of the early people that my father reached out to to, uh, in his letters to talk about um, what is Zen and uh, all of that. And, um, and so uh, Tokian was an early teacher for my father. Um, so it's really a lot of fun and uh, to, to read them both. Do you... Um, it's very interesting how, you know, your father and your, your grandmother um, brought this to this country in different ways um, to America. Do you feel like it's some kind of a balance factor to capitalism and the fact that it's such a materialistic society? Do you think that Zen is kind of the counterpart to balance it out? I could say that. Yeah, I do think that... Um uh, that the practice of deep meditation and letting go of attachment uh, is is uh, very useful uh, at, at a time like this, especially when there is so much stress uh, for so many people going on. Um, and so I I think that uh, it it's a very helpful thing for people who who are interested and want to take it on. Um, yeah. You know, um, when I receive kind of, let's say, soul messages, it's mostly at dawn time, right as the right before the sun rises. I wake up and I just feel future things, artistic thoughts, and all these things. Um, is there a time when you're most connected to the other worlds? Uh, yeah, I think so. When I'm in nature. Mm-hmm. I would say uh, that's that's one of the times when I'm most feel most connected, and the other time is when I'm working with people. Mm. And right? that, that therefore your your um, annual uh, classes actually take care of both of those things because the location is in nature and you're working with people. Right. So. Right, it's a stunning place, and you know. So I do that once a year, but then um, I'm doing workshops uh, many times a year f- and in different parts of the world for the Human Awareness Institute. Mm-hmm. And we lead a series of workshops called Love, Intimacy, and Sexuality, mm-hmm. and uh, we le- we lead them in many different countries, and uh, they're weekend long workshops, and um, you know. Uh, my my experience in that uh, is that really what we're teaching people is about love <clears throat> and how to how to really be in a place of love with themselves and with others and um, and so for me to be being love with a group of people is uh, a, a, an extraordinary experience. And I feel so gifted to be able to do that again and again and again. It was a very healing uh, experience for me when I did my first workshop. And uh, and I was so moved by that that I uh, took on the challenge to become a leader because it felt to me like such amazingly important work. And... Uh, and that was the last thing I ever would have imagined myself doing, as you know from my from my projection of myself as a child. Mm-hmm. 
that's wonderful that you've allowed your life to to lead you in all of these ways and uh, to be able to grow constantly and unexpectedly. Um, yeah. What is the website for this uh, organization? Uh, it's called www.hai, H-A-I for Human Awareness Institute, .org. Okay, great. And we are about to roll out a new website, um, I think around January 17th or so, um, a whole new website for people to get to see and go to. Perfect. So I'm excited to see what our organization has created. So, dear audience, by the time you hear this, the new website will most likely be up. So it's hai.org. Um, right. You know, as we uh, begin to wrap up the interview, which has uh, been really fantastic, so I really am grateful that you're on the show. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you this question. You know, you mentioned when somebody's on a pedestal, there's no way to go but down. I want to ask you this. Um, sometimes when somebody's on a pedestal, they actually can become iconic. They can become kind of godly. And um, people can, can what with that? kind of godly. A religion or, or something similar can start um, around a person or a person's thoughts. I'm wondering if in the future, perhaps, there would be an Alan Watts kind of similar thing to a religion. How would you feel about that? My first reaction is to gag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, that's you know, great. I'm so not into that. Mm -hmm. My work with people is to say, um, you are equal to anybody on this planet. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. We're all equal, and different ones of us have different strengths and talents. Great. And, um, and so, uh, again, like my father, I'm not into the guru thing. I just, mm -hmm. I, it, it, and, you know, part of that is um, when I uh, was younger and people would find out who my father was, mm -hmm. um, there was one woman who asked if she could touch me. Mm -hmm. And... For me, that was nauseating. It was just like <laughs> over the top, you know, just ridiculous. And I, I want to say the thing about talismans, too. Talismans can have their place, mm -hmm. but my concern about that is, what if you lose your talisman? Mm -hmm. If you put your faith in that thing mm -hmm. rather than in yourself, mm -hmm. I feel like that's risky business. That's and, um, you know, I mean, I think we all have things that are comforting to us mm -hmm. and precious to us, but it's also useful not to be attached to them. Mm -hmm. Living in Santa Rosa, um, our, we were threatened by these fires mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. And when the fires started, I was, um, I had just done a workshop in Boston, in the Boston area, and I, um, as I got on the plane, I talked to my husband and he told me about the fires. And uh, there was this moment on the flight when I felt like I had to release everything I owned. Mm -hmm. You know, because we could have lost everything and many people did. And, um, and so, you know, I feel like our ability to let go and move forward is really important. And um, so I'm not, I'm not a big one on this whole business of um, idolizing people or, I mean, I think it's a wonderful to learn. My father has made such a difference in so many lives mm -hmm. all over the planet. Mm -hmm. I've just been having emails with a young man from, I uh, can't remember if it's Denmark or Sweden, 15 years old, and he's discovered Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's being transformative for him. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think that's beautiful and extraordinary. And, um, you know, while my grandmother, uh, who was a very serious, very by the book, um, scholar and, um, and very principled in her practice of Zen, um, 
she did some very deep work for people who are deeply into them. Mm -hmm. And she translated uh, works from uh, Chinese into English, which is so helpful for people who are deeply into that study. Whereas Alan, she's hardly heard of at all, right? Mm -hmm. And, and Alan and his work was very, very popular. And, um, and so he inspired people to, um, to enrich their lives. And he had a very different way uh, about it, which I think um, is, is suited to a, a larger group of people than the people who go into that very deep, very intense study. And, um, and so, you know, Great. they've each done something very powerful and very useful for the world in their own way, which I think is wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's a great way to complete the episode. Um, thank you for speaking with us, Anne Watts. And the book, again, is called The Collected Letters of Alan Watts. Um, and the websites that you can check out are hai.org and Ann Watts website, which is annwatts.com. Thank you for being on the show. All right. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me.